God inspired Moses to record the creation of the first week in the first two chapters, actually chapter 1, the first three verses of chapter 2 of Genesis. During the course of the seven days, God revealed there was a need to refurbish earth and reestablish life on earth due, due to the destruction of God's previous creation of a planet that was filled with life, according to Isaiah 45, 18. It was created to be inhabited. And so we are told there was a need, again, for refurbishing and reestablishing life. At the conclusion of God's creation of the final life form, which was man, God summarized here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, the results of all he had done over the course of six days. We find in verse 31, Then God saw everything that he had made. Everything. Did not exclude a thing. Everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and morning were the sixth day. At the time man was created, we are told here that everything on earth, everything on this planet was very good. There was no evil to be found anywhere in all of the physical creation. There simply was no evil. Everything reflected the goodness of God, including the garden that God prepared for man here in chapter 2. It was in that environment of the garden of paradise that God placed man and instructed man concerning the necessity of following God's every instruction. In verse 15 of Genesis 2, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. It's all there for you, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There will be nothing to stop death. After God had established a relationship with man, and instructed man of the need to obey him in order for everything on earth to remain in the state or the status of being very good, God then allowed an evil spirit to manifest itself on earth and to have access to man, the man and the woman. That evil spirit succeeded in convincing man to disobey God which set the course of humanity in the direction of evil. In so doing, the evil spirit was able to usurp the dominion of the earth that God had given to man. He had given it to man. We read that earlier in chapter 1. Man was then doomed to be under the influence, the binding influence of that evil spirit who we know to be Satan, the devil. In less than 2,000 years, Satan totally corrupted the earth that had been very good at the time God created it into a world, a cosmos, so evil that humanity's every thought, we are told here in chapter 6 and in verse 5, concerned evil. Every thought concerned evil. Note, Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, note, every intent, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There was no break. Everything was always just the opposite of very good. The evil of man's heart led to a world filled with perversion, with hatred, and with violence. Going on down here to verse 11 of chapter 6. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. God looked everywhere, and yes, corruption was universal. For all flesh had corrupted their way, 
or his way, it can be either way, his way, that is God's way, or mankind, their way. What was normal, what was natural, had corrupted their way or God's way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God, who is love, that's what we're told back in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. And God, who is love, could not allow humanity to continue on the course of evil any longer. It would be futility to allow that situation to go on. It was necessary for him to stop that evil, to bring it to a halt, and then restart human civilization. The flood during the days of Noah came at a time of great spiritual darkness that was hovering over this earth. Through his prophets, God warns us that the same type of darkness that existed at the time of the end of that age coming up to Noah, that same darkness will encompass the world at the close of the age. Jesus warns us Back in the Olivet Prophecy in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and in verse 37. That the end of this age will parallel the final days of the world before the flood. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, as they were, corruption, hatred, violence, so will also or so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, without question, brethren, we live in a time today of great spiritual darkness where perversion and hatred and violence seem to worsen daily. You know, whether we're talking of uh, biological weapons, chemical weapons, you know, the things going on that uh, supposedly are taking place in Syria. You know, whether it's that or many other things, which we'll get into as we go on. Wherever we look, it seems that every day it just gets a little worse and a little more worse. In fact, the setting for the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets that we are here to observe today will be at the darkest point in humanity's existence. There will be no time any darker. The Feast of Trumpets is the only festival to fall on a new moon. None of the others, based upon the way God uh, says to count time, none, none of the other holy days will fall. None of the other festivals will fall on the new moon. And it's on the new moon of the seventh month. Not the fifth month, not the sixth month, or any other. It's on the seventh month. And he chose the seventh month to establish the keeping of this festival. That means that the Feast of Trumpets and all that the Feast of Trumpets represents occurs immediately after the darkest point or the darkest part of the sixth month. When there is no light whatsoever of the sun reaching the moon. This is because the events pictured by this festival occur again at the darkest point in the history of mankind. Man was given six days, or the equivalent of 6,000 years, a thousand years for a day, as we know from Psalm 90 and 2 Peter chapter 3. Man was given 6,000 years, six days to do whatever he chose to do, to labor in doing evil, because that's what he's done to labor in doing evil. But when the sixth day is done, God will force man to rest or cease from doing evil and will then require man to do things God's way, which is the way of doing good. It is not doing evil. It is not pursuing the path to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's doing good. This day in the plan of God represents the ending of the darkness which mankind has brought on itself by walking contrary to God, by pursuing evil. 
Humanity at large does not grasp the meaning of this festival of tabernacles. Even though, like the flood of Noah's day, it signifies stopping evil and restarting civilization. Jesus made it clear that only those selected by the Father and led to Him would have the ability to understand His plan. You know, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Go back to Matthew 13, we won't turn there, but in Matthew 13 the disciples said, well, you know, well, why do you speak in parables? Well, it's not given to them to know, it's given to you. I, you know, the Father has drawn you out, and you are allowed to see. So God makes his selections, and then individually he intervenes in their lives to instill in them a teachable spirit, a teachable mind. But how will God go about opening his calling to this world, which, despite its evil ways, thinks it's okay? I mean, you talk to people and you read articles and, oh yeah, you know, mankind, you know, we're going to be just like Jean-Luc Picard. We're going to be out there in another 40 or 50 years sailing through the galaxy. We only think good thoughts. We only do what is morally right. And we do this, that, and the other. You know, Star Trek is fantasy. Star Trek is fiction. That is not what man is capable of doing on his own, apart from God. Cannot do it. And yet, that's what mankind, oh yeah, we're okay, we're okay. You know, there was that book a few years ago, I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, no, no, we're not okay. Not as long as we're cut off from God. Not as long as we're cut off from the tree of life. How will God get the attention of the world? Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23 and verse 2. God commands Moses to speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. These are God's. These are not optional to keep. If we're going to obey God, then we must keep them. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Well, today we're at the appointed time. Notice in verse 24, the appointed time to proclaim the Feast of Trumpets. Verse 24, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Or Tanakh translates, commemorated with loud blasts, a holy convocation, a time of convening or assembling as we have done here today. This day pictures a time of triumph, triumph that is achieved through the blowing of trumpets, a triumph over evil, because that's what this world is. It is enmeshed in evil today. This fourth festival of God focuses, turn over to Isaiah chapter 61, this fourth festival focuses on the importance of Christ's second coming. Here in Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Now, this prophecy is a prophecy of the words of the Savior. This was not Isaiah. This is the Savior. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now Jesus quoted 
this, at least the first part of this prophecy that goes on in the next several verses, he quoted the first part of this back in Luke chapter 4. And he then, after quoting that section and then coming to a stop before he finished the prophecy, he stated then that he had fulfilled all of the prophecy up to that point where he stopped at his first coming. He had fulfilled it. Now, he taught privately to his disciples the last part of the prophecy here in Isaiah 61, and he did it through the Olivet Prophecy and through the book of Revelation that God inspired the Apostle John to record, showing that the day of vengeance refers to his second coming. Here in, in verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. There is a day of vengeance coming, and it is connected to the time of his second coming. Isaiah's prophecy states that Jesus Christ has been anointed to proclaim the day of vengeance. How does he make that proclamation? One way is every year through the Feast of Trumpets. This feast proclaims a need for God to intervene in human affairs to put an end to evil in a very final way. Note here in Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. We have the culmination of what happens that is symbolized by this particular festival. Jeremiah 4, beginning in verse 19. I'll read this from the New International uh, Translation. Oh, my anguish, my anguish. This is Jeremiah speaking of this vision that he sees. My anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. The sound of the shofar. I have heard the battle cry. Disaster follows disaster. The whole land lies in ruins. In an instant, my tents are destroyed. My shelter in a moment. How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? My people are fools. This is God speaking in verse 22. My people, God says, are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. People that have access to him. And what does he say? They are skilled in doing evil. They're skilled in doing evil. Not in doing good. Not in righteousness. But in doing evil. They know not how to do good. They don't even know how. Again, very similar to what we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Every intent of the thought in the mind of man before the flood was evil continually. Well, they don't know how to do good, just as they didn't then. He goes on, then Jeremiah does in verse 23, I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty. He's talking about the planet, not just land. He's talking about the planet earth. I looked at earth. And it was the Hebrew, tohu vabohu, the same term used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now the earth was without or became without form and void, tohu vabohu. It was formless and empty, and at the heavens, I looked up at the heavens and their light was gone. The earth was covered in darkness, just like Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before His fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Everything's going to be ruined, but I'm not going to bring a total end to everything. Not like what happened 
in Genesis 1, verse 2. It's not going to get that bad. Therefore, the earth will mourn and the heavens above grow dark because I have spoken and will not relent. I have decided and will not turn back. There is nothing at this point that can stop what God has prophesied. It is inevitable. There will be no great turning back to God. Not at this point. Will not happen. Most of the Old Testament prophets spoke of this day some more explicitly than others. In Zephaniah chapter 1, let's go back to the minor prophets. Zephaniah chapter 1, and beginning in verse 14. Zephaniah 1 verse 14, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out, That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. That's what this day is picturing. It's a day of trumpet. It's a day of alarm. It's a day of the blowing of the shofar. Back a little further in the Minor Prophets to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. So again, we're talking of the time of the trumpets, what this particular festival symbolizes. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. That is, let them be afraid. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them. Even for many successive generations. Down in verse 11. The New International translates, The Lord thunders at the head of his army. Now he's coming to engage this group mentioned in verse 2. So he is coming with his armies. We'll come to this a little later on. But he's at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? That's quoted by John later on in Revelation chapter 6. Who can endure it? Who's able to stand during that time? The day of the Lord, the day of vengeance, is necessary because evil is so deeply entrenched in the thinking and activities of humanity today. It is so deeply penetrating that man simply can't let go of it. He's been brainwashed to reject God or to think that God somehow brought all of this into being through evolution, you know, by happenstance or whatever, unbelievable stupidity uh, of human beings. But that, you know, just that concept of evolution shows you how the mind has been so warped to believe such tripe. And you just look at any life form and say, there's no way this could have ever evolved. You've got to be a brainless buffoon to believe in such tripe. Anyway, I read some on evolution this week. So sorry about that. Get back onto the straight and narrow here. Uh, over in uh, uh, Psalm 50, Psalm 50, verse 1. Psalm 50, verse 1. The New International translates, The Mighty One, God, The Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, that is, from the entire surface of the earth. God is summoning mankind, humanity. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. God has been silent. He's let 
pretty much almost 6,000 years other than that little interruption with the flood of Noah. He's kind of let things go, let man do what man wants to do all the way from the time that he was cut off from the tree of life. Our God comes and will not be silent, not any longer. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. Skipping down to verse 16. But to the wicked God says, God speaks to the wicked, the evil of this world. What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. Because there are many, there are millions who take God's name, talk about Jesus Christ, talk about God. And they'll even go to the the, the Bible and try to base what they do. They can somehow substantiate Sunday observance, which the Bible says is worshiping demons to do so. But they can do that. And God says, what do you think you're doing? You don't have a right to declare my statutes. You don't have a right to talk about my covenant because you don't do it. You hate the instruction I give, and you cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented with the thief and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You purposely lie. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done. And, God says, I kept silent. I let things go. You made the decision that you would take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you have gone the way of evil. Lock, stock, and barrel. You thought that I was altogether like you. You thought because I kept silent that I had no problem with what you were doing and all of the evil that you were committing. But I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now, consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. You repent of what you're doing, I will show salvation to you. So we find here in Psalm 50 that God formally charges humanity with hating his instruction and deliberately trashing the Holy Scriptures. When he says up here in verse 17, you hate instruction, cast my words behind you. You don't want my words to lead you and to guide you, to show you where to walk and how to step. That's what God's word is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a lamp that we hold in front, and it lights the way so that we can see the the, the path that leads to righteousness and follow that path to what's good. It's a difficult, and it's a narrow way. It's not the broad way of this world. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, God has a few more things to say about what man has done. How he has taken what was very good initially and turned it into something very corrupt and very bad. Isaiah 59, verse 1. I'll read from the Tanakh translation. No, the Lord's arm is not too short to say, or his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have been a barrier between you and your God. Your sins have made him turn his face away and refuse to hear you. Note that. Your sins have made him turn his face away and refuse to hear you. For your hands are defiled with crime and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips speak falsehood. Your tongue utters treachery. No one sues justly. Or pleads honestly. They rely on emptiness and speak falsehood, conceiving wrong and begetting evil. And that's not just the politicians who do that. That goes right on down to the man on the street. Conceiving wrong and begetting evil. 
Verse 5, the New International translates, They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds. Note that. Their deeds are evil deeds, and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They don't wait and think it over. No, they rush straight into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. Yeah, now, how much peace is there on earth today? Uh, I don't think there is any. If there is, somebody, you know, enlighten me. But if anything, you know, we're on the brink of global war. So, verse 9 uh, the way of peace they do not. There's no justice in their past. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. So justice is far from us. And righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if it were twilight among the strong we are like the dead. We have no strength. Verse 12, Tanakh renders, For our many sins are before you. Our guilt testifies against us. Note this. We are, this is humanity talking to God, we are aware of our sins. We're aware of them. And we know well our iniquities. Yeah, we know, you know, we've heard uh, what people quote the Bible and say this. So yeah, we're aware of those things, but you know, well, we don't believe it. Yeah, we're aware, you know, the way you define sin, God, the way you define evil, yeah, we know that. So what? That's the attitude, a very flippant attitude. Humanity acknowledges that it's aware that the path it follows is not in accordance with the instruction that is written and preserved in God's Word. It's an acknowledgement. Verse 13, the New International goes on rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on God, on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. This is describing our world today. That describes this country, describes every country. Truth is nowhere to be found. As soon as someone opens their mouth on television, you can almost be assured that it's a lie. Every time a politician opens his mouth, you know it is. Because they're there based upon wanting to stay there forever. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. Or as the New Living Translation has, says, whoever renounces evil is attacked. Well, you know, that's gone on here in Washington. You know, there was a uh, florist down in Richland, you know, just a, right down from where the post office is that, you know, we do our mail at. And that florist said, well, hold on, you know, I'm not going to provide flowers for a homosexual wedding because I believe that homosexuality is wrong. The Bible says you shouldn't do it. So what happened? The attorney general of this wretched state sued that florist. So, you know, God says, he who renounces evil is attacked. That's exactly what happens. That's what happened then. There was the family, the, the, the family in Portland, Oregon, just a little on, ways on down the road here from us, and they ran a bakery. They refused to bake a cake for a lesbian wedding, quote-unquote, and so they then are attacked. They're people who say, you need to be shot. If you read some of the tweets that was 
uh, that people were tweeting this, this outfit, these, these people. They had to shut their bakery down. No, you tell it the way it is, you quote God, and what happens? You get attacked. That is the world we live in. The Lord looked on this and was displeased that there was no justice. That's where we are today in this world. Satan, the king over all the children of pride, we're told in Job 41, verse 30, 34. You know, Satan, Leviathan, is the king over all who are proud. And Satan is largely responsible for the present pride. Pride-filled belligerence that man has can go right back to him. God will deal with Satan and the pride that Satan has infused into the thinking of mankind. He's going to deal with it all right. Notice in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. Isaiah 2, verse 11. That pride's going to be dealt with. It's going to be dealt with as far as man's pride during what is pictured by this festival. Verse 11 of Isaiah 2. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. You know, Richard Dawkins and his, you know, the God myth. Well, one of these days, old Richard Dawkins is going to have to admit that God is not a myth. You know, maybe he'll be granted to live and see Christ return. Maybe. One way or the other, he'll watch it in instant replay if, it's, if, he's in the, if he's in the white throne judgment period and doesn't get a chance to repent before then. But, you know, to, to belittle God and to, to trash his word as Dawkins has done and others just like him. Lofty looks. Oh, I'm so brilliant. I know better than what's in this book. Lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. There won't be any agnostics, there won't be any atheists left at that point. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. That's what the day of the Lord will accomplish. The existence of evil in the world reveals that there is something critical that is missing. Something that must be instilled in the mind of humanity before mankind will turn from evil and submit itself to the rule of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, again, chapter 66. Isaiah 66 and verse 1. Tanakh translates, Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. I created both. Where could you build a house for me? I, mean, I created the heaven. I created the earth. So where are you going to build a house for me? What place could serve as my abode? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But, on this one will I look. You want me to dwell somewhere? Let me tell you where I want to dwell. I don't care about any physical temple you can build for me. You don't want to know where I want to dwell? On this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. That's where I want to live. I want to live in that mind. That's what God is saying here. But again, he who trembles at my word. The missing ingredient that is so critical that isn't found today in the world is what causes men to tremble at God's word. It is the very thing necessary in order to begin a relationship with God and learn what God expects of us. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7, one of those memory verses, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding of knowledge, of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. That must be there first. Going on here in verse 3, Tanakh goes on, As for those who slaughter oxen and slay humans, who sacrifice sheep and immolate dogs. I'm talking about those who make sacrifices to him but have no problem in murdering someone. Either you know, outright or with their tongues, because there are those who do that as well. 
who present as oblation the blood of swine, who offer incense and worship false gods just as they have chosen their ways and take pleasure in their abominations, so will I choose to mock them, to bring on them the very thing they dread. For I called, and none responded. I spoke, and none paid heed. They did what I deem evil. No, God says, they did what I deem, what I call evil, and chose what I do not want. Or they chose what New International says, what displeases me. Purposely, purposely, they walk contrary to God. Down here in verse 15, Isaiah goes on, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So all flesh is going to be judged. Not one will escape God's judgment. That is the judgment of the day of the Lord, the time of the vengeance that God brings to this world. The Apostle Paul summarized from the Holy Scriptures, what today we would call the Old Testament, he summarized from the Holy Scriptures the extent of the evil of humanity back here in Romans chapter 3. And when he summarizes, he takes a quote here and there throughout what we call the Old Testament, and then he finally comes down and connects it to all of these problems to a lack of the fear of God. Note Romans 3, verse, verse 10. As it is written, and now he begins a line of quotes, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. No, there's none that does good. That means that they all do evil. Their throat, verse 13, is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There's the reason for all of these problems. There is no fear of God. Now, God is going to remedy this particular situation. Back in Psalm 55. Psalm 55 and verse 19, the New International translates, God, who is enthroned forever, will hear them and afflict them. Men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. God is going to inflict all who have no fear of Him. That's what we're told. In Proverbs 16, Proverbs 16, verse 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So what takes, what's, what's required for men to depart from evil? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Back again in Psalms, Psalm 102 this time. Psalm 102 and verse 13. You will arise and have mercy on Zion. For the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So the nation shall fear the name or the authority, all that the name encompasses, which is the authority and the power of the Lord. Nation shall fear the authority of the Lord, the power of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Now the set time that he mentions here in verse uh, 13 
The set time to instill the fear of God is directly connected to the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets pictures the force God must use in order to show mankind how much God hates evil, how much he despises evil, thereby establishing the fear of God. Now, how does he instill this fear of God into all the nations? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 1. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. There's a blessing for those who take heed. Now in contrast to those who are blessed for reading, hearing, and then acting on the revelation Jesus has given us through the Apostle John. In contrast to them, curses await all who refuse to read, who refuse to hear, and who refuse to take heart the warnings that are contained in this particular book. And as far as that goes, spread throughout. Because many of these prophecies summarize prophecies that have been given by the major and minor prophets, even David in the Psalms. Many of those things are contained here and placed in order in the book of Revelation. Let's go to chapter 6 and verse 12. Chapter 6, verse 12. I looked, John says, when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became like blood, the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come. It's finally here. The sixth seal identifies the beginning of that day and who is able to stand. The sixth seal is the key to understanding when the time of God's wrath begins. The word day here, the day of his wrath, the word day means a period of time that's determined by its context. This day that he mentions here is not a 24 hours, is not 24 hours in length, it's not a 24 hour day as is proven by the events that we read on and find that are contained within this period, as defined by God or by Jesus Christ in the pages that follow. It will be a one-year period based upon the day-for-a-year principle found back in Numbers 14 and in Ezekiel chapter 4. A day a year. So this day will be a year in length. Notice in Isaiah 34. Let's turn back here real quick. Isaiah 34 verse 8. <clears throat> For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. The day of the Lord's vengeance. The year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So the day of the Lord equals the year of recompense. Now, let's go on to Revelation chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It says, When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, saw the seven angels which stood before God. To them were given seven trumpets. Then we come down to verse 7, and we find here in verse 7, the first of these angels blows the trumpet. And there follows hail and fire mixed with blood. They were cast upon the earth. Third part of the trees was burned up. All the green grass was burned up. Then we have the second angel in verse 8. 
And then there was something like a huge mountain burning with fire that was cast into the sea. Third part of the sea became blood. Third part of the creatures in the sea died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. We read on in verse 10. The third angel blew its trumpet. There fell a great star from heaven. And it was blazing like a torch, the New International says. It fell upon the third part of the rivers and the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood or poison. Were poison, I think the New English translation has. Because they were poisoned. And verse 12, the fourth angel blew its trumpet. The third part of the sun was smitten. Third part of the moon. Third part of the stars. So as a third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it. And the night likewise. So we have here the first four trumpet plagues. And these are pretty disastrous events. Because they end up destroying one third of the food supply of the earth. Which fits right in with Ezekiel and what Ezekiel says regarding one third shall die by famine. In chapter 9 verse 1, the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star. Fallen from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the, the key of the abyss. Now this fallen star is the angel that Jesus said he beheld fall from heaven, which is none other than Satan, the devil. And so he was given a key to the abyss. He opened the abyss, there rose a smoke out of the pit, smoke of a great furnace, and... Says the sun, the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, came out of the smoke, locusts on the earth, to them was given powers, the scorpions of the earth have power, it's commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, or any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. To them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So we find here that the fifth trumpet, is something that will bring a phenomenal amount of pain upon mankind, upon those who are still practicing evil at the time. Verse 11 then says, They had a king, these locusts, which again, when you go back, go on down through uh, verses 6 through 9, uh, 6 through 10, describes these locusts, and they're something more than locusts. As they get closer to John, he's able to make out the appearance even better. But nonetheless... We find in verse 11, they had a king, these locusts, or this, this army, had a king over them, which is the angel of the abyss, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. Both mean destroyer, depending on whether it's Hebrew or Greek. It still means destroyer. Now, when we read through the fifth trumpet, it is very clear that it says it, the blast will last for five months. That's what it, the blast signifies goes for five months. This is proof that the Feast of Trumpets does not represent a 24-hour period within which all seven of the trumpets are fulfilled. It is not a 24-hour period. There's still people who want to hold on to that. They totally ignore what the Bible says. Open your eyes and read. Verse 12 of Revelation 9, One woe is past, behold, there come two woes more. And then we read in verse 12, And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day, and the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Now this is pretty specific, because it says the hour of a particular day, of a particular month, of a particular year. So, to me, this day is not talking about a year, this is not talking about uh, you know, anything other than a 24-hour day. And it's in one of those hours when what follows occurs. So this is something that's going to strike, and it's going to strike very quickly, and it's going to be very short as far as the duration that's allowed. Now, remember, this is symbolism. It talks about four angels, four angels that are bound. 
That is, they are prevented from doing something. Now, God indicates back in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, I won't turn there, but He says there that Satan today is restrained from inflicting premature death on no more than one quarter of the human population. You know, we've gone through the four angels of the four, first four seals a number of times before. Now, the four angels that are mentioned here are possibly paralleling the horsemen of the first four seals. That is, the angel of deception, the angel of division, the angel of destruction, and the angel of death. Those are the four horsemen. Now, as we saw when we covered that material in the past, I think it's in the Daniel Revelation book, if you are uh, not familiar with it, you can go back and read it there. But we find there that those angels all certainly fulfill what Satan the devil has done. He fulfills all four. But God said only one quarter of humanity could be destroyed prematurely. And yet, God is going to loosen the restraint on these four angels so that they can kill more than a quarter of the human population. They're going to be able to kill one-third, and one-third is a greater percentage than one quarter. So God is going to lift that restraint. He's going to move the restraint back a little bit so Satan can kill even more. So now, after this war, as he goes on to say, now, verse 16, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard the number of them. In verse 18, by these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Now this number, 200 million, this number could represent the massive army that we know will be assembled from Asia and will invade Israel in order to make war with the armies of the beast that will already be there. Or this 200 million could be the total number of all of the world's armies that will be involved in what seems to be a global nuclear war that will destroy all of the cities of the earth and thereby taking out a third of the human population. In fact, all of humanity would be destroyed except for the war being cut short by the seventh trumpet. God has already figured that in, Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 and 22. He's already made certain that those days would be shortened. He only allows this war to go on for one hour, and he will stop it with the seventh trump. Down in verse 20, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now incredibly, after such massive devastation, just a few days after the two witnesses are killed, back in chapter 11. This is only a couple of days later. Humanity will, re, will, will remain obstinate, absolutely concrete and resolute in clinging to its wickedness rather than turning to God for mercy. That's what this says. Even after two-thirds of humanity has been destroyed, the fear of God will still be missing in the hearts of the vast majority of mankind. It just won't be there. And that will necessitate what takes place in chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were uh, great voices or loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, immediately after this event, the saints in the first resurrection attend the marriage supper with Jesus Christ, during which time an angel is sent, here in Revelation chapter 14, an angel is sent to make a proclamation to mankind that still doesn't have the fear of God after all of that. Notice verse 6, Revelation 14. 
Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Note, fear God. Man is told, you had better fear God. You want to survive, fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, fear God and give glory to Him, frankly, is good news. It is a gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. The good news or gospel of the kingdom, which is to be preached to all nations, is that God is coming. And He's coming in great power to put an end to all evil. The evil that has permeated the society before the flood and has certainly permeated the society after the flood, culminating to what we have today where there is no truth. Truth cannot be found. This passage in Revelation 14 about this angel is the completion of the prophecy Jesus made in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. You know, there in the Olivet Prophecy, he said that this good news of the kingdom of God must be preached or will be preached or proclaimed throughout the entire world. And it's done to be a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Now the two witnesses spend three and a half years proclaiming the gospel. And then this angel comes and concludes it and emphasizes it. This message, this good news, the gospel preached at Christ's return by an angel is the same gospel that Jesus began to proclaim at Galilee and that the apostles went on to preach after his death. Remember in Mark chapter 1, we are told where Jesus came into Galilee and what was he doing when he came into Galilee? His first appearance. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what he was doing. He was preaching it. He told the people then that the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. You better repent and believe the gospel. If you want to be saved, you've got to repent. If you want to be saved, you've got to believe the gospel. The gospel is the explanation of how God will reconcile mankind to himself. Each of the seven festivals of God mentioned back in Leviticus chapter 23, details the steps God is taking in order to achieve that reconciliation that started back there in, in, Matthew, in, in Genesis chapter 3 at the, the, uh, when the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was taken. The fourth step of that reconciliation, pictured by the Feast of Trumpets, is to instill the fear of God into all nations so that all of humanity recognizes the authority of God and the authority of God's word over their lives and will cease doing evil. Which is again what they've done since Eve plucked that fruit off and then took a bite and handed it off to Adam. That was evil to do that. And man has been doing it ever since. It's what he practices on a daily basis. Now, chapter 16 of Revelation, we'll go ahead and wrap up the remaining, remaining events of the trumpets. Here in chapter 16, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of, out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out its bowl. Notice in verse 11, after the fifth bowl is poured out, and there's darkness over the face of the earth, and, and men are in pain. They blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Even after two-thirds of humanity gone, five bowl plagues have been poured out, and still many will not repent because they are missing the fear of God. Here in chapter 19 of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 11. 
And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. This is after the seven bowls have been completely poured out. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You Look back up, verses 7, 8, and 9, you find out these are the saints who have participated in the marriage supper. And out of his mouth, verse 15, goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the last stage of the seventh trumpet is the battle, as it's called back in chapter 16, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And in verse 19, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and, uh, and with him the false prophet that performed miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So all who refused to repent right down to the very end, those who lack the fear of God will be killed by Jesus Christ. Now earlier, we noted that the events pictured by this festival, this festival of trumpets, occur, those events occur at the darkest point in the history of humanity. And that God chose this time, the time of the new moon of the seventh month, to be the appointed time for the Feast of Trumpets. As we've covered many times before, the moon cannot produce any light of and by itself. It cannot do it on its own. The moon's light is all reflected light from the sun. The sun, or the morning star, represents Jesus Christ, according to Malachi, and to the Apostle John. You can read their writings and see that the sun of righteousness, S-U-N, Malachi says, the morning star, the bright and morning star, the sun rising, so that its light permeates the darkness, and mankind has light once again. That's Jesus Christ. He is representing the sun. The moon represents the church by virtue of its relationship to Jesus Christ. Remember, New Covenant, let your light so shine before men. Okay? And how does the light shine? By the presence of Jesus Christ. The power of Jesus Christ abiding in Galatians 2.20. That's how that light is produced. That's how we reflect the light of Jesus Christ. At the time, however, of the new moon, only a very small sliver of the moon may be seen. We might be able to, we'll probably be able to see it tonight because it's been one day into the new moon. Okay? And so we'll be able, maybe if it's clear, to see a little sliver of the moon tonight. Just a little bit. Not like that bright full moon. It's just a little bit of light that you'll be able to see. But at the time of the new moon, there's only that very small sliver. At this darkest point in the history of humanity, we find the church is also in almost complete darkness. The church being the moon. This darkness is symbolic of the spiritual state of the church at the close of the age. The majority of the members are failing to reflect the light of the Son of God in their lives. This is made clear when we read Jesus' uh, assessment of Laodicea back here in chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. I won't turn there because of time. But you go through and read about Laodicea. He is nauseated by the self-sufficient pride that permeates the final stage of the New Testament church. The question is, brethren, have we taken that assessment personally that Jesus has made concerning Laodicea? 
Have we taken it personally and repented of the Laodicean state of mind? Or is it, oh, that's what that group over there, they're all Laodicean. Oh, those are Laodicean. You're not doing the work like me. You're Laodicean. You better look at that yourself. You better take it personally. Whether you're the head of an organization or whether you're just, you know, one of the members who is there attending to listen to what you have to say. You better take it personally. I take it personally. What is my life? Is my life Laodicean? It better not be. But there's only a small sliver of light that comes from the church at the close of the age. We're warned by the Apostle Peter that we are now being judged. 1 Peter chapter 4, 17. We're now being judged. Judgment is now in the household of God. Daily, brethren, we must give account of ourselves to God. Do our actions reveal that we revere Him and that we fear Him? Or do our actions reveal that we have heeded the trumpet warnings sounded for us through the written Word of God and the ministry of Jesus Christ? Jesus emphasizes the seriousness of failing to heed His warnings back in the closing verses of the material that he relayed concerning the new covenant and those who enter into that covenant with him. In Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21, Matthew 7 verse 21, he's already stated earlier in verses 13 and 14 how narrow the way is, the way to life. The path is very narrow, it's very difficult. He's already warned us. And he tells us to beware of false prophets. Those who come and try to lead us astray for their own selfish ambition and gain. Then he comes to verse 21. New Revised Standard translates, Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Claiming to serve Jesus Christ as Master is absolutely worthless if the will of God is not being obeyed. Don't think that by your physical works that you do that somehow you're getting brownie points with God. He goes on in verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Well, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name? We've had television program after television program. We have printed thousands, millions, tens of millions of magazines. We've done this, we've done that. We've cast out demons in your name. We've done many wonders in your name. Again, there are some who have deluded themselves into believing that physical works, again, that are done. Well, I've done them in the name of God. I've done them in the name of Christ. And somehow, somehow that earns them credit. Somehow they're going to get salvation and they're going to have a high place. Maybe even above that little widow over there, that little widow woman. Maybe, he, maybe he'll even be able to, to be above her. Verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those who practice lawlessness are those who have not used the Spirit of God to control their minds. Because if we're using the Spirit of God to control our minds, We should not be lawless, that is, taking God's law for granted. Not obeying. Practicing evil. People may physically keep the letter of the law, but there is no change in heart just by keeping the letter of the law. If all we're doing is trying to obey God's law under our own power without using God's Spirit to transform our mind, we will never please God. Because if we're trying to do it alone, remember what God told, uh, what God told Job about Satan. You lay a hand on him, buddy, you can't do it on your own. You cannot control that being on your own. You've got to have the power of God to do it. Verse 24, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. The sayings, Jesus talks here about his sayings, these sayings of mine, the sayings of Jesus can refer to the entirety of the word of God. 
But the context here that he's giving us at the close of the Sermon on the Mount indicates his reference is to the specific information and instruction regarding the New Covenant and what's required of those under the New Covenant that he gives. Back beginning in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 until the close of this chapter. Our reaction to his instruction should be, as the Apostle James states, back in James chapter 1, verse 22. Again, one of those memory verses. We must be doers of the word and not hearers only. We've got to be doing something, brethren. We've got to be doing something with the power of God's Spirit that has been invested in us once we repented and were baptized and received that gift. Our foundation must be the rock, Jesus Christ. Without His presence in us, there can be no change in heart. There can be no conversion. Verse 26, now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Jesus has established the proper approach to the new covenant. Whoever decides to use a different approach than the one that he has given us, after having heard his instructions, is destined to fail. There is only one path that he mentions back up here in verses 13 and 14. It's a very narrow gate, it's a very difficult way. That's the only way to get there. We can't choose it to do it our way. To think that we can somehow still be a part of this world, and go the way of this world, and doing the evil of this world, and being the kingdom of God. It will not happen. So brethren, are we among the wise that he mentions here who heed, or among the foolish who don't? The wise hear the sound of the trumpet, and due to their fear of God, they obey. They take action. They become doers of the word. At this darkest point in the history of mankind, when evil has reached its fullness, you know, the iniquity of the Amorites, believe me, has been filled to the full at this point in time. At this point, let's be grateful for the truth that God has imparted to us through His plan. And let's be thankful that we've been specially selected to understand the fear of God today. For by exercising that fear, we will be able to avoid evil and fulfill Christ's admonition to us, his end-time disciples, here in Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 34. In Luke 21, 34, Jesus states, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness. That's evil. You better take heed because the evil in this world is so great. It permeates everything. Take heed to yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness. The cares of this life. All you see is the physical. And that day come on you unexpectedly for it will come. As a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always. That you may be counted worthy to escape. All these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Who will stand in that day? Revelation 6, verse 17. Who will be able to stand? The only ones, brethren, are the ones who heed what Jesus Christ has told us to do.